Hi guys, welcome to Moon Lane TV. I'm Sophie Cleverly. I'm the author of the Scarlet and Ivy series. I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about me and about Scarlet and Ivy, but also about my new series, The Violet Veil vale Mysteries. And the first book, A Case of Grave Danger, is out today. I'll be telling you a little bit about that book, as well as doing an exclusive reading and a writing activity. Some of you guys might already know my Scarlet and Ivy series of mysteries. They're set in the 1930s. I've got all six books in the series up here. This is the first book, The Lost Twin, and The Lost Twin tells the story of a girl named Ivy Grey, whose twin sister Scarlet mysteriously disappears whilst away at a spooky boarding school named Rookwood. And Ivy gets a letter one day saying that she must take her sister's place. So Ivy goes to Rookwood and when she's there, she finds that she needs to hunt down pieces of Scarlet's secret diary in order to find out what really happened. And the rest of the series then follows on with the twins solving all sorts of different mysteries in and around Rookwood and some other interesting places as well. I'm just going to pop Scarlet and Ivy back on the shelf because I'm here today to talk about my new series, The Violet Veil vale Mysteries. So the new book is out today. I unfortunately don't have a finished copy while I'm filming this, but I do have a lovely picture of the cover. So this is the lovely cover. This was designed by Hannah Peck. She also did all the interior illustrations and she is a brilliant illustrator who has also worked on some great series such as Nevermore, which is one of my favorites. So that's really exciting. A Case of Grave Danger tells the story of Violet Vale. And Violet is the daughter of a Victorian undertaker and she's rather fed up with her life. She thinks it's a bit dull. She's expected to sit around doing embroidery and playing the piano. She'd quite like to be her father's apprentice, but he doesn't really think that she's up to the task because she's a girl. So she really wants a bit of excitement in her life and to be able to prove herself. And one day she gets her chance when a boy comes into the undertakers who they believe to be dead. But later that night, Violet hears some strange noises coming from out in the cemetery near their house and together with her trusty dog Bones they go outside and they find that Oliver is actually alive and well. So Violet and Bones must help Oliver to solve his own murder and find out what's really happened before it's too late. I actually came up with the idea for this story when I was lying in bed on a rather dark and spooky night and it was when I was studying for my MA in writing for young people at Bath Spa University. So I was having to come up with a lot of different story ideas and I was trying to think of something that would be a cool idea for a story. And for some reason, the words The Undertaker's Daughter came to my mind. And that really gave me the idea for a story about the daughter of an undertaker who would probably be surrounded by some quite spooky and mysterious goings on that she could investigate. And at the same time, I for some reason had this image in my head of a girl picking apples out in a cemetery and I thought that this must be my main character and the image was very sort of beautiful and happy to me and that made me think that the story would be about someone who was very joyful and full of life and looking for excitement even when surrounded by death and sadness. So if you're all sitting comfortably I'm going to give you an exclusive reading of chapter one of a case of grave danger. So I've got my lovely print out here. I hope you're all ready. Chapter one. I was born in the mortuary. Topsy-turvy, I know, but that's the truth of it. My mother said the slab was cold and hard, but that she was in no fit state to quarrel at the time. They named me Violet for the flower, the twin to my mother's name, Iris. I think they were hoping I would be a shrinking Violet, modest and shy, but it was soon apparent that I was not. My middle name is Victoria, after the queen, they said she was in mourning for her husband these days, roaming the palace all dressed in black. I didn't see anything unusual about that. Father had clothed us in dark and sombre colours for as long as I could remember. We're always in mourning for someone, he'd say. Being on the edge of life and death was a funny thing. Sometimes, out among the graves, I could sense the dead. It was just a feeling, an echo of emotion, a scattering of words. It was a part of me, and I had grown used to it. Grown used to keeping quiet about it too, because all I got were strange looks and shushes from grown-ups if I were to mention it. Often the dead didn't have much to say, but I was soon to encounter a dead person who had a lot more to say than usual. The day of the miracle I had recently turned 13 years old and I was out collecting apples in the cemetery. 
I took a bite of one and it was as crisp as the autumn air. My black greyhound Bones ran circles around my feet, sniffing the ground with his long nose. Bones was a fairly recent addition to the family. I had found him wandering among the headstones. As soon as he'd spotted me, he wouldn't leave me alone. He wore no collar and looked skinny, but then all greyhounds do. I named him Bones, because growing up as the daughter of an undertaker and living, as we did, beside a graveyard, it just seemed fitting. I fed him scraps and begged Mother to let me keep him. She said no. So I asked Father, who said maybe? Mother finally gave in and said I could have him, but all the same, she made Bones sleep outside. For two weeks he slept just beyond our back wall, curled at the foot of a stone cross. By the third week, Mother took pity on him and let him sleep in the back garden. It was only a few more days before he was in the house, and often on my bed. Now he was my constant companion, at least when he wasn't distracted by doggy things such as chasing squirrels and chewing shoes. That day, when my skirts were full of the ripe fruit, I dashed back through the graves and into the parlour, the funeral parlour that is, leaving bones rolling in the grass. The breeze whipped my long dark hair across my eyes. Father was sweeping up when I got in. Honestly, Violet, can't you use the back door to the house? What if there had been someone in here? Someone, I chuckled. Your guests are usually a little too dead to notice, aren't they, Father? He huffed at me and shook the broom out of the open door. I turned to see Bones trying to get a mouthful of broom before Father tugged it back. And what about the family members? They could be visiting the deceased. We don't have any visitors. Not today. I know the arrangements. I do pay attention sometimes, you know. Really? You surprise me. He tussled my hair affectionately and then mopped his brow. What are you going to do with all those apples? he asked. But he turned away, and I could tell he was no longer paying attention. In the past he would have played with me, juggled the apples, told me some little story about how fruit was somehow a metaphor for life, but he always seemed rather distracted these days. I looked around the room. My arms were aching with the weight of my skirts, and I suddenly realised I wouldn't be able to hold on to them much longer, but neither did I want to spill the apples all over the floor. Aha! There was a coffin on the dais, freshly varnished and upholstered, but currently empty. Perfect! I lifted the front of my dress and tipped them all in. It made quite the racket, as you can probably imagine. That got his attention. Violet, he shouted, spinning round. Good heavens, girl, whatever do you think you're doing? I grinned at him. I just needed somewhere to put them down for a moment. Don't worry, I'll have them out of here before you can spit. I do not wish to spit, he replied. I realised it was time for a hasty exit. So, with Bones trailing behind me, I scooped up an armful of the red apples and headed through the door into the house. Mother was in the kitchen, darning some of Thomas's socks by the fire. Apples, I called cheerily. She looked up and smiled, her bright eyes lighting the room. More apples? I'll be making a pie or three, then. Add them to the basket in the larder. I did as she said. When I returned, she spoke again. You know, my dear old mother used to say that an orchard in a graveyard could only grow bones. How wrong she was. She pulled the finished sock from her darning mushroom and tossed it aside. Though we do seem to be overburdened with apples. She looked down at the dog. I'm sure this one would prefer a beef bone. Bones pricked up his ears and sat wagging his tail, perhaps hoping Mother might actually have one somewhere about her person. You could make a fine bone broth with one, I said. My brother Thomas came in just then, his black trousers scuffed at the knees with dirt and grass stains. Yuck, he exclaimed, throwing his leather football to the floor. Who wants nasty old bone broth? Mother reached up and gave him a gentle clip on the ear. He was only six years old and not yet as tall as me. He was off school for a few weeks after his school had been flooded. I still thought it unfair that he was seven years younger than me, but he got to go when I didn't. But then I was a girl and he was a boy, and that was just how it was for us. You'll eat what you're given and you'll be thankful, whether it's broth or five apple pies. We have to make do these days, and look at the state of your trousers. Mother was forever having to fix and alter our clothes whether it was for repairs or to try and keep up with the latest fashions. Thomas dragged a chair out from under the table, scraping the legs on the floor. Then he sat down heavily on it and ruffled a hand through his dark hair. A few blades of grass fell out. Bones ran over and sniffed them while Mother rolled her eyes at the sight. I was about to return for more apples. After all, Father would not be pleased if I left them where they were, when Thomas spoke again. Mother, he said, who's to be buried in plot 239? Bones looked up at him, his eyes like small galaxies. Mother put down the darning mushroom and stared at the wall for a moment in thought. Is that one of the new ones? It's just been dug out? Yes, he replied solemnly. A young man, I think. He came in this morning. No relatives have come forward for him, poor thing. But your father will see to it that he gets a good burial. He always does, even though it isn't very good for business. 
I shivered a little and took hold of the chair back to steady myself. I remembered the young man she was talking about from earlier. He was fairly tall and pale, with blonde hair a little on the long side. He couldn't have been much older than me, sixteen perhaps. I'd sat with him for some time, just talking to him quietly. Even the dead need company, though I never heard much back from them when they had recently passed. It was though they hadn't settled in yet. Why do you ask, Thomas? I said. He looked up at me. I just wondered. There's been a few in a row. What if it was murder? He made a horrified face. Murder most foul. Mother narrowed her eyebrows at him, her favourite look of disapproval. Murders? What nonsense. You've got a vivid imagination, my boy. Have you been reading those penny dreadfuls again? They are not suitable reading material for a boy of your age. Thomas stuck his tongue out and I covered my mouth with one hand to suppress a giggle. Mother tutted at him. Your imagination is running away with you, she continued. There have just been some nasty accidents, that's all. She went back to her darning. Bones padded round the table and sat by my feet. I stared into his soulful eyes and, not for the first time, wondered what he was thinking. He had a strange sense for these things, as did I. My skin was beginning to tingle, and I wondered if there was something to Thomas's bizarre theory. There had been an unusual amount of men in their prime in the past couple of weeks. Three or four, I thought. And now this boy. I wondered what could have happened to him. Surely it couldn't be murder. Father would have noticed. Wouldn't he? I hope you guys enjoyed that. What we're going to do now is we're going to do a mystery writing activity. Today I wanted to show you how I plan a mystery because planning when writing a mystery is especially important. Having a plan for your story is a bit like having a map when you go on a journey. It's really helpful to make sure that you know where you're going and that you don't get lost. The way I plan my mysteries is actually to sort of work backwards. So I start with the solution. I start with what actually happened, what was the, the crime or the incident or the murder, and then I work backwards to think about how that happened. So today I'm going to take you guys through my step-by-step -step way to plan a mystery and hopefully you can have a go at writing one at home. So I thought today we'd start off with quite a simple one. We'll start with a stolen object. So let's say it's the crown jewels. So I'll draw my little crown up here. You can see that. The next question we need to ask is who stole it? So who is the thief in this story? So let's say it was the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, let's put PM. Now the next question is where did they steal it from? So where was the crown when it was stolen? So let's say it was in the Queen's bathroom and it was perhaps in... Uh, a lovely sort of glass display case in the Queen's bathroom. So now that we know where it was, our next question is why did the person steal it? So why did the Prime Minister break in to steal this crown? Uh, perhaps he wanted money. Uh, he wanted to buy lots of cheese and crackers because he was very hungry. Now we want to know how did they steal it? So in this case, how did the Prime Minister break in to steal the crown jewels? So perhaps we'll say he stole a tank and drove through the door of Buckingham Palace and broke his way in, broke through the glass and that was how he stole it. So now we know a fair bit about the actual crime. Who is going to investigate it being stolen? So that's the person who is going to be the detective in this story. Uh, let's say it's the Queen's Corgi. So uh, Mr. Corgi, let's put him there. Lovely. When Mr. Corgi goes on this investigation, what clues is he going to find su to suggest that this is what happened? So quite a good one is always some fingerprints, perhaps, um, or footprints. Or maybe we'll have some uh, tyre tracks from from the tank, perhaps. Um, oh, gosh, can't spell. I hope you can read my writing, by the way. Um, we could have something more personal. So perhaps it's a piece of the Prime Minister's tie that broke off. Perhaps there was lots of CCTV footage, uh, some video footage of the crime taking place. Though we assume the Prime Minister probably had a mask on, so we couldn't see that that was him. Now we need a different type of clue. 
we need some red herrings. And you might have heard this term before. So a red herring is a clue that leads the detective in the wrong direction. So it leads them to the wrong conclusion. Um, so let's say that the fingerprints that uh, they found perhaps lead to the wrong person. Perhaps the fingerprints belong to Prince Charles or the butler or a maid or someone like that. So red herrings are really important to throw both your detective and your reader off the scent so that they don't guess the solution to the mystery too early. And another thing that's really good for your readers is to have a twist, a twist in the tale. Um, so this is something that seems really unexpected, but if the reader's been paying close attention, it should make perfect sense. So let's say one of these people that we found, one of our suspects that we perhaps thought might be the wrong person, um, so these fingerprints maybe led us to, like we say, the maids and the butler. And perhaps we thought, oh no, the butler, it wasn't him, we've ruled him out. Well, perhaps in our twist we find out that the butler was actually working with the Prime Minister in order to steal the jewels. And that would be a great twist for our readers. And finally, we want to have a satisfying solution. So by the end of the story, we want Mr Corgi to know that it was the Prime Minister who stole the crown jewels that he stole them from the Queen's bathroom, that he did it because he wanted the money to buy all the cheese and crackers, he did it by stealing the tank and breaking in through the wall. Um, we want him to have found all of these clues, he's been led off on some different distractions, there's maybe been a big twist, and now he knows everything. And now we need a satisfying solution to tie it all together. So perhaps Mr Corgi is finally able to follow the trail of crumbs to the Tower of London where he finds the Prime Minister and the butler eating all of the cheese and crackers that they've bought with their stolen money from selling the crown and then he's able to uh, drag them out by their trousers and have them arrested. So there we go, we've solved the whole mystery. Solved. This is basically what I do for every mystery that I write and it's very simple but it really helps you to have this plan. So I hope that you guys can have a go at this at home. Thanks so much for having me here on Moon Lane TV. I hope you guys have enjoyed the video. A Case of Grave Danger is out today. You can get it from Moon Lane bookshops, of course, from other lovely bookshops. You can get it online. You can get it from your local library. So I really hope that you guys will enjoy it. Thank you very much. Bye.